Hey everybody, welcome to the Renaissance Woodworker and welcome back down to my shop. It's been a little while since I've had you guys down here, been doing Woodworking in America footage. And this is another Woodworking in America update. This is really my really my first episode on the seminars I attended at the Hand Tools and Techniques Conference in Valley Forge. And I wanted to talk a little bit today about Adam Carabini's presentation on joinery planes. And as you see spread out before me, it is my, um, I'd like to say, pretty respectable collection of wooden planes. Um, Adam, Adam put on a really great presentation. And he started out by saying that the average joiner in the uh, 17th and 18th century had about 65 planes, which I think would give a lot of us toolmongers heart that, you know, we haven't, we haven't hit our limit yet because I think there's probably very few of us that have 65 planes right now. But what was interesting is when we really began to break down those planes, and, and we broke our, Adam broke them into really three different areas. There were uh, leveling planes, ornamentation planes, and fitting planes. And I'm actually referencing my notes down here. I'm not looking off into space. And obviously the, the leveling planes is what most of us would think of as, uh, you know, bench planes. And the Stanley, Stanley series of bench planes, you know, one through whatever, in the typical joiner's cabinet really comprise only three, maybe, maybe four planes. Um, we've got your, your joiner plane. This is a big 28-inch um, long joiner plane. Um, a triplane, which would be kind of the equivalent of today's joiner planes, about 22, maybe 24 inches long. Um, you've got the jack plane or four plane, and really the triplane and the four plane um, might have been, oh, I'm sorry, the, the joiner plane and the uh, four plane may have been a little bit more interchangeable as we may see that the um, the trying plane might have been used for the more what we think of as jointing and flattening of stock. But regardless, I guess the well-equipped joiner of the 17th and 18th century would, may have had these three planes and then finally a smoothing plane. This is a little coffin smoother that I've gotten. So we'll say at best four planes. You know, that leaves us with 61 more planes that we've got to figure out where they come from. So then we look at ornamentation planes, and that would be molding planes. And this is really what you're seeing over here on, on the left. I was extremely fortunate to come across an almost complete collection of molding planes from a woodworker in California, right around the California Gold Rush period. His name was Cornelius Stout, and um, a gentleman that I hooked up with on eBay actually had run into his joiner's chest and was selling off parts of it. And I, um, I think I got a pretty respectable deal on, on this set of planes. Again, there are actually a few duplicates in here. I've got a couple of uh, 3 8 inch rounds um, and a couple of unmatched pairs. Uh, for those that don't know, uh, molding planes will usually, you can come in a pair where you've got a, a hollow and then a, it's matching round. And ideally, when you put them together, that profile will match. Um, actually, this matches quite well, which is, again, another um, benefit that I was able to come across this set from a joiner's toolbox. You'll be able to find molding planes very easily on eBay and you know, in different widths, but just because they're the same width doesn't mean that profile is necessarily going to match up. And that's up to the, the craftsman to really tune and refine those planes so that you get matching hollows and rounds when you're doing your molding. So think about how many router bits you might have. And, you know, the average woodworker may have about 25 router bits. Router bits that you use, you know. Well, in that case, I have about four. Well, lately, I have zero router bits that I use because I've been doing everything by hand. But your average woodworker is probably going to have about 25 router bits, maybe at most 30 router bits that they're using on an average basis. We'll kind of lump those into the ornamentation side of things. So nice round number, we'll say 25 uh, planes or ornamentation planes. Well, that still gives us, you know, 30 some planes. What was my math here? 65. Uh, we'll just say, yeah, so we're still talking about 30 planes that we've got to find where do they come from. And that really fell into the joinery plane side of things. This is a um, moving filister plane. It's actually uh, needs quite a bit of work. Um, it looks pretty good. It's got this uh, integral brass depth stop in it here. Um, the one thing it's missing is an iron for the knicker. Uh, there's a hole right here for a wedge. 
that will hold a knicker iron, um, and I'll need to make one of those up and make up the wedge for it. It's got this movable fence on the bottom, hence the moving part of the filster, and it's used for cross-grain dado cuts. Uh, this happens to have a skew profile on the bottom, and it can cut up to a two-inch wide uh, dado, if need be, based on the width of that blade. This is another dado plane. Looks very similar to uh, my Lee Nielsen shoulder plane. In this particular instance, it was used for making uh, rabbits and dados along the grain because there is no knicker iron for cutting cross grain. Um, I actually, uh, I have another dado plane that I won on eBay recently that I haven't received yet that has the, the iron, the, the double iron that sticks out of the bottom for scoring both sides of that. And actually, um, Adam was able to pass around a couple of these planes in his conversation and he showed us the usage of one and I'll show that quick little snippet to you right now. Dado is backwards. Why? Because those knicker irons are going to score the wood. So as you can see, and you might have missed it at the beginning of that video, the first thing you do when cutting a cross grain dado is you take that plane with the knicker iron and you run it backwards across the stock and it will score lines for that dado. And then from there, you run and take your dado to the depth. If you have a brass depth stop, you set that and you just wait until the plane stops cutting. Actually a very easy setup, very easy to use. One of the things that Adam mentioned in that video you saw is he actually tacked a, um, a fence right onto the board and he used nails to tack it in place and he's actually seen evidence of furniture in the Philadelphia Museum of Art where there's tiny little holes above a dado. He never quite could figure out what those were until he started working with um, dado planes and realized that the best uh, and, and most secure way to hold that fence in place was nailing it in place. So, you know, again, we can take heart and you nail something into a board and you think, oh my god, it's leaving holes, but look at the, the masterpieces from the period and you'll see tiny little holes where they had nailed in a, uh, a fence to guide that, that data plane. So, joiner planes is making up the lion's share of that. We've got moving filsters and data planes and plow planes for running rabbits along the grain as well. Um, any number of them in different widths so that, you know, say you want to cut a... Uh, uh, a dado to fit uh, a cab or a shelf side or something like that. It, today we focus mostly on three quarter inch stock. Back then it was mostly seventh eighth, seventh eighth inch stock. So a lot of these uh, shoulder planes were seven eighths of an inch wide to accommodate that. Um, to find a three quarter inch shoulder plane is actually kind of difficult these days because they didn't use three quarter inch stock very much. Half inch you saw, you would see quarter inch and things like that. So it, it's interesting to see how the tools actually can shape the work and draw you closer to the period of craftsmanship. Um, one of the other things that uh, uh, Adam talked about was making a, a drawer blade dado, where the, the dado that's actually attaching those drawer dividers and drawer blades in. And again, you saw in that video how he nailed it in place. Then he turned it around and he made a groove for that back panel and said that, you know, the period cabinet makers were all about getting things done quickly. So you had this shoulder plane that we use to, to smooth out the rabbit. But again, it could be kind of slow to come in and continually take passes and you're taking, you know, at most maybe a sixteenth of an inch shaving or thirty second of an inch shaving set pretty rank with one of these. So Adam showed us the technique to kind of quickly remove that waste using a chisel and then come back over it with a plow plane or shoulder plane. Take a look at that here. <laughs> Just dig that out of there. Got some of funny grain reversal here. What of this do you see? You see that? You see what I did there? Yes or no? Yes. Yeah. 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 So now you just have that nastiness. Okay. 
Adam showed us a, a couple of our techniques of just making joinery with planes, but you know it was clear in saying that you know the lion's share of the joinery was dados and rabbits. When it wasn't those, it was dovetails, and that was pretty much done with saw and chisel. Um, most of the joinery that he showed us, you know, a lot of the, the accurate results relied upon careful layout and marking. And if you've ever seen Adam work before, he's got this cool little marking gauge that he uses that just held the fence itself is just held in place with a wedge. And I know I had seen it somewhere before, and sure enough, Adam made reference to the fact that Dean Jansen wrote an article for Popular Woodworking on how to make that little marking gauge. And um, the, he said, you know, I'm, I'm sure we can put a link up on the site. And I heard Megan Fitzpatrick from the back of the room say, yes, that link will be available. And if it's not already, it will be by Monday. And sure enough, Monday they posted a link to it. Um, if you go to popularwoodworking.com and just punch in Dean Jansen and marking gauge, you can find it. But I'm pretty sure the uh, link is now available um, on the Woodworking in America recap. And um, I'll just go out on a limb and say you can find that link right here at the bottom of the page. So the last thing um, Adam mentioned was that he had actually just done some heat treating of his irons and he threw out his recipe for heat treating. He basically takes a, a torch and heats up the irons um, until they're, you know, not cherry red, but until they're kind of glowing red. And then he quenches them in oil. Be sure to quench them in oil, not water, as water will cool them too fast and they will warp. Once he's quenched them in the oil, you know, it wipes them down, cleans them up, and then puts them in an oven at 400 degrees for 30 minutes to um, temper them. And, and that was it, really. And he had said that he, you know, got really amazing results with it. And in fact, I got a chance to try out several of his planes at the hands-on session later, and they cut beautifully. They cut just as well as any of my Veritas or Lee Nielsen planes cut. So, hey, you know, it, it's hard to say how long that edge will hold up, but Adam seemed pretty... Um, pretty comfortable and pretty confident that the edge holds up nice and long for his work. So, um, you know, that was kind of the gist of what we talked about. Uh, Adam gave a very entertaining presentation, uh, had a lot of humor. He said that, uh, you know, he's best friends with a lot of the power tool manufacturers because hand tool woodworking is hard. And as uh, one of the uh, executives at Delta Tools told Adam, you help me sell a lot of power tools because guys read your stuff and don't want to play with hand planes anymore. You know, it takes a lot of skill and a lot of practice to get used to these. These um, these old wooden planes, you know, it makes you really respect your Lee Nielsen's and even your, you know, Stanley Refurbs, uh, these things. You know, they're not terrible, but they take some tuning up, they take some working with. It's a very different feel than the metal hand plane, but I think once you start working wood on wood, you really will enjoy it. And, you know, I'm really just getting started on this. I've done some eBay work. A lot of these planes still need some heavy restoration, but I'm looking forward to putting them into service and putting them to work. Now, one of the last things Adam talked about was just kind of his take on the purity of the time. And, you know, Adam has become almost iconic with his uh, uh, 18th century joiner's dress. And I can actually testify to the fact that Adam does wear normal clothes. I saw him out at the bar later that night and uh, jeans and a t-shirt and I almost didn't recognize the guy. If he wasn't so tall, I probably wouldn't have recognized him. But Adam says, you know, I don't wear these clothes because I like them or they feel good on me. In fact, more often than not, I'm sweating like a pig in these. But I wear them because that's how it was. This was the truth of the matter. This is what the joiners wore. I use the techniques that they use because I want to show you how it was done. Not out of some personal preference, but out of a desire and a, a, a need to show you this is what was done, this is how it was done. And I found that particularly admirable. And I actually uh, uh, sought him out in the marketplace later and told him how much I appreciated his honesty and, and just his kind of glib and, and dry wit throughout. It was a very good presentation. Adam was extremely humble and, and modest and said, well, I'm glad you got a lot out of it. Um, I was in his first presentation, so I'm sure he actually only got better as the weekend went on. And um, to close out this episode, I will show you uh, Adam putting his money where his mouth is. Here are a few clips of Adam at the Hand Tool Olympics cutting a dovetail. And since I was flattered and honored to hear that Adam watches my show and reads my blog, Adam, I edited out some of the naughty bits, so no worries. And I even edited out your total time. Although, folks, I will tell you, he cut him faster than I did, so he has nothing to be ashamed of. But since I didn't clear it with Adam first, I edited out the time and I edited out the naughty bits. Not that there was that many naughty bits. Thanks for watching guys and enjoy this clip of Adam Carabini cutting dovetails.
Yeah. No one said that in the best word. He's like, first beat, I just take the two of them and drive right through. Uh-huh. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Then you just do your straight, flip it over, do your straight, you can do it three of That chunk that comes out of here is like a rock and it just goes in. You can aim it actually at people if you want to. You can get some of your stomach. You aim them at people, yeah, they don't, they, and they, then you, I just tell them, you know, I, I, I tell them. People don't know you can aim them that well. It was corn flour, damn it! Oh, I call it Terry Martin. Corn flour. Huh? All right, corn flour. They were, they were snappy. Some kind of flour. <laughs> we'll just call you flour. Some here. Well, unless you don't have any nails. Is that why they invented the dovetail? They yeah, ran out yeah, of nails. This is the best lighting I've ever worked on. Bad. Yeah, it is bad. Yeah, we forgot the video. We can still got half the time. I'm going to start genuinely, and then I'll try to do some tackling here. Get the ambiance up. Oh, you just lost That's Frank Klaus's respect yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I can't do that like Frank Klaus. We've got all them fat saw blades and stuff to use. I'll make sure I got this right now. No, I put the hands on the waist. I can't really see the baseline. I'm just going to use the force here. Put so your butt a quarter of an inch below it. That's right. Oh, it's good. That's good. Perfect. my favorite detail. What'd you guys do? Coping saw this cross? Chop. You can do either way. Up to the person doing it. Ryan chopped his. I chopped mine. It's not a coping saw waster. A coping saw waster? Yeah. Okay. But others are. That's why it's there. Try to be accommodating. I'm trying to decide what I'll do here. Well, decide as you go and you learn something new today. That's right. Cope it. The interesting part of this is you get a half inch chisel. See, we just brought one chisel because it's easier than having 20 of them. This thing, I, where's the 5 16th? I only use 5 16th. <laughs> uh, I'll cut dovetails when this an R in the box. Yeah. You're a winter dovetail. Oh, beat them together. Stuff in there. No, this is a little bit stuff in there. I just can't wait to be done so I can say, do 10,000 more like this and you do it too. <laughs> mm. Let's see, did I get it right this way or this way? <laughs> now you could beat that. One thing I never hear it discussed is that you can fix this. It's a little bit tight at the baseline. You don't have to <coughs> fix it. Though. That's a little too tight, really. Split. That's just too tight right there. Did you time stop the time? Okay. I heard it stopped. I thought I did too. I never